Hi everyone, Blender 4.4 is almost here, or maybe it is here depending on when you're watching. But to go along with 4.4, we have updated our modular workspaces add-on to version 1.9, which has turned out to be one of the biggest updates we've done so far, I think. Largely thanks to Gixo, my co-contributor on this project. So what we're going to do is of course talk through the new features and we'll take a look at how they can help to improve your workflows. But first of all, we've got to install it. Now Modular Workspaces is technically an extension type add-on, which means if you go to Edit and Preferences, you see we've got two options here, Get Extensions and Add-ons. Under Get Extensions, you want to go to the drop-down in the top right here, then Install from Disk. Find where you downloaded the add-on, so you'll notice in the download files there's the Modular Workspaces add-on and separately Modular Workspaces library. To install the add-on, obviously you want to select the add-on zip file, then when doing that, it will install it there. What this should do is if you press the N button over the 3D view, it'll bring up the right panel and you will see modular workspaces here. Now to install the accompanying asset library, if I go to where I downloaded the zip files, we see we got the library zip file there. If I open that, I'm just going to extract the folder anywhere on my computer and then going to go into it and grab the directory. We'll see that there are two text files in here with the modular workspaces library blend file. These text files tell Blender how to organize the categories in the asset browser. So I'm going to take that directory go to file paths in the preferences then under asset libraries I'm going to click the plus button over here to add a new entry then I've pasted the directory into the top here and you'll see that there are no items in here but that's perfectly fine we're just giving blender the directory then if I press add asset library that will add modular workspaces to our list so it'll be accessible from the asset browser so that's basically how you install it it's relatively simple now as for the add-on if you've used it before you may notice a few subtle changes so first of all a very very tiny change the unpack settings have now been put into a collapsible menu just to tidy things up a bit you'll notice that new buttons have appeared in the interface so these are our toggle buttons which have been very popular with the add-on they allow you to modify the buttons to choose any editor to appear and disappear in different sides of the screen so we can see i have like a left button for the shader editor i've got a bottom one for the asset browser geometry node editor on the right info on the top etc so you can just click and toggle them on and off and they are also accessible from a pie menu which the default control is alt and space so that lets you flick them open and close easily. Now that was in previous versions, but there have been some changes. So for the asset browser settings, where you've always been allowed to define your default settings, what I mean by that is every time you open the asset browser with this add-on, you're going to be able to choose an asset library to automatically load. So you don't have to choose it from the dropdown every time. Instead of having to type in the library name, it's now a dropdown. So it will show you the list of all the asset libraries you have connected in your preferences, and you can choose and select them and it will update live. So you can actually visualize the changes you're making to the default settings as you go. The same thing applies to the other settings as well. You can like see how they look to get them how you want them with some real time feedback. We've also added the default sort method, which is represented here as well. And whether or not you want a close asset browser button there can be toggled on and off. So if I open the asset browser and press this toggle, you can see that there and you can also customize the text for it if you like. So you can remove the text and it will just be this tiny X if you like it like that. Additionally, filters have been added. So with this drop down here, you can enable and disable the filter as you like. So again, the purpose of doing it here rather than under the filter drop down here is that this will apply every time when you open the asset browser. So you're effectively defining your default settings in this little box. So it'll be exactly how you want it when it opens. Now, due to a popular request, we have also added the ability to change the settings for the asset browser for every single workspace. So you can have it be global settings, which means for example, if I'm in this workspace where I've got like double 3D view, if I open the asset browser, it will open on the settings that we've already defined. But if I wanted to have a different set of asset browser settings for this workspace, then if I go to work, spaces then asset browser settings you will notice that there's this new option for simple and advanced so under simple which we've been working in the whole time so far we're defining the global settings for the asset browser but if i go to advanced we have the option to define them just for this workspace so we can customize the behavior on a workspace basis so see that after clicking on advanced it says settings for double workspace if i press plus new bottom area config i can now choose a different library for this specific workspace and also different settings as well and filters. So this means that if you have specific workflows, like multiple workflows for one file, and you want to be able to access different asset libraries or different types of content within each of those asset libraries as you move through the workspaces, then you can set that up easily. So notice as I close and open the asset browser here with the Pi menu, it's got my Afterglow library, but if I go back to the 3D view, close and open, it's on the modular workspaces library. So you can split them up that way. So talking about the toggle buttons up there, we've got some extra settings you can play with. So obviously we've got the icon only mode which removes the text but now we also have the 
use custom icon feature, which means that you can actually change the icon of the editor to pretty much anything from the entire set of icons inside of Blender. So if you want to, you can give it a custom icon, and then of course you can hide the text. And what that will do is give you this minimal customization, or rather a minimalist approach to customizing the buttons. So to make that even more minimal, I can disable the other buttons. So let's say I disable the left one. So I'll disable them all actually, and then I'll go back to the bottom area and turn that on. So I've only got the asset browser. Then I can make that icon only, so because you've got an extremely minimal setup here with just the asset browser button in the top, which we can click on and off to load the asset browser with our default settings, which is lovely. But you'll also notice this one number here in a circle. So if I disable icon only, we'll see that whenever we're editing one of the toggle buttons, so we're under the bottom area here, as well as having the primary editor we can choose, which is obviously asset browser in this case, we also have the option for a secondary editor. So what that means is if you click on this one, it will take you to the next set of your custom button options. So you can have two sets going at once. So it's on one at the moment. If I press it for two, then it will show us our secondary editor instead. So what that means is if I turn all the buttons back on, we can have up to eight different editors accessible through the toggle buttons, with four being under number one and then the next four being under number two. Additionally, you may notice that when I press to open up the asset browser, some options are grayed out. This wasn't always the case. There was a bit of a change with how the Blender interface worked some versions back. That meant that we couldn't do like perpendicular splitting. So you can do vertical splitting at the same time, but you can't do like, you know, vertical and then horizontal. You have to get rid of the vertical one before you go horizontal. It was just a bit of a weird limitation with the interface. But when saving and loading files and moving between different files, we always try to remember the state of how you were splitting the interface so that you could just pick up from where you left off and you know keep flicking the editors on and off. In some cases you would need to force the add-on to forget the settings you'd already done. So if I press forget areas and then split again, you see that it's now forgotten the one we already had open. So depending on what you had going on, that was a necessary feature to help you reset the memory of the add-on for the space you were working in. In previous versions, that forget areas button would appear on the right side, which means that as you opened something like the asset browser, all the buttons would shift to the side. And it would get a bit annoying because you'd have to keep moving the mouse to like click the toggle back off again. But as you can see, we've now moved it to the left, which means that you could just keep clicking away and you don't have to move your mouse at all. So it's not going to mess with that muscle memory. All right, so those are the main features. I think the largest one so far is actually the advanced option for the asset browser settings, because that one's going to have the most potential when working across different workflows or workspaces. But before I show you some changes to the asset library that's included with modular workspaces, I'll just show you that if you want to customize the hotkeys, then under the toggle shortcuts, we've got custom hotkey areas here. So for example, the Pi menu, it's on Alt and Space by default, but you can totally change that to whatever you like. Enable and disable the Alt, Control and Shift options. This is also great if there's like incompatibility with other add-ons. So if you've got an add-on installed which is already using Alt and Space, then you can just like shift it to whatever you feel more comfortable with. When I'm using it myself, I like to bind it to the mouse back button, which will be a different number, like depending on how your mouse works. But I like using that because I don't need to touch the keyboard at all. It's really quick and I can just like press it with my thumb and flick up and down. And the toggle shift shortcut, as you can see, is shift or an X. So if I press that, what's going to happen? So you see that it only works when you're hovering over the 3D view, but it's your quick access to swap between the one and two. So Shift Alt and X is going to give you access to those uh, hot swap buttons, if you like to think about it that way. Now, one of the main features of modular workspaces is not just all the interface stuff I've shown you, but it's actually the ability to unpack collection assets from the asset browser once you've got it open and automatically organize them into different collections, which are appropriately named and also center them in the world center, preserving the parent and child hierarchy, if that's important for the collection asset and also to kind of clean up the names. So that's like the main feature. It's funny it took this long for the video to mention it. Now, there are a bunch of preset collection assets in here, including things like world nodes as well to help you get started in your scenes. But I just wanted to make a note about the character lighting templates. So at some point in the past, I did an update, which was a collection of like stylized preset rendering setups to help people light things like characters. Because we had some extremely simple collection assets and I wanted to throw in some more complex ones. But there were some lighting changes in Blender a while back that meant that the original versions of these setups became a bit incompatible with newer versions in the way that the light radius values were intersecting with other elements of the setup. And it just looked a bit weird. But to quickly explain it to you, 
view. For the character display setups, which have their own category, they each have a name and they each have a collection asset you drag in and a volume node, which you can drag into your world nodes which is going to give you a proper atmospheric effect, which has been balanced to look in a very specific way. And there are different options you can turn on and off. Uh, Noir is a very, you know, bland and black and white grayscale silhouette type one. But in the original video, they're explained a bit better. Let me throw in a much more vibrant one. So they are effectively just like fun starting points for character type renders. Okay, but those character templates are more stylized. Let's do something a bit more generalized. So this will apply for more people. Using the HDRI and color background node, which is included actually, let me just show you that. It's right here. If I plug in the surface, it lets you plug in an HDRI image texture, but I can also just choose the background color. I'm gonna go for something like mid like that. Let's drag in a test donut. I'm gonna turn the HDRI strength down. The color is the substitute. So we've got white background and a shape. Let me drag in study lighting and a shadow catcher and then unpack that you see what we have here is a basic kind of physical presence scene plain white background an object to analyze and a shadow catcher catching the shadows on the base so you know the opposite of stylization this is like your pristine clean general scene to put literally anything you want in it you may also notice that this test donor object which used to be just an untextured or unmaterialed object now has a reflective and a matte surface as well so it's just a quick test object to see what's being reflected in the scene in terms of light so if you actually plugged an hdri in that'd be much better actually maybe i can access one from my afterglow pack um, afterglow is a different product of mine let me just uh drag one in and see how that works there we go so i'm turning the strength up let me turn off the lights we imported so this is actually using just an hdri and no scene lights now one thing to note about using an hdri for the scene is that obviously there's more light coming from all directions so the shadow catcher is going to be less visible but it's still there i should also note as well that the shadow catcher previously and kind of accidentally had the ray visibility enabled by default for the diffuse glossy transmission volume scatter but you'll notice it's visible in the reflections. So they've also been disabled as a little update for the asset library. So let me remove the HDRI. I'll show you like another lighting setup. Let's go back to the modular workspaces. And lighting, you'll see there's a few lighting setups by default. One of them is studio lighting. If I press unpack, it will center it. Let me turn the HDRI down. Studio lighting is basically really bland and basic. Moody lighting is a bit more creative because it adds some kind of color variability in there. But let's clear that file entirely. There are still more types of setup. So for example, if I drag in the diorama color one, it's an entire light catcher type setup here. If I click on the camera and enter it there, this is your starting point. Please note that the bloom is actually from my startup file. Without it, it will look like this. And just to clarify this, in case you weren't paying attention, when I drag the collection asset in, or when you drag any collection asset in, it's only one object in the outliner. That's because it hasn't been unpacked. With the modular workspaces add-on, if you select the unpack setup button there, it will automatically, as I said, unpack it into appropriate collections already organized for you. Then you have customization over the options here. So you can choose whether to unpack only the selected collection assets, whether to center them, whether to organize them. And the key parent and hierarchy is if there's content in those collection assets, which already had a hierarchy you want to preserve. So before my camera overheats, I'll leave it there. Um, a link to the product will be in the description and the pinned comment. And if you made it this far, then leave a box type emoji in the comments so I can see if you did make it, because I like seeing your familiar faces. We've worked quite hard on this, especially Gixo, the co-contributor on the project. So thank you. I hope you find it useful and I will see you next time.